here uh, for now. So <clears throat> let me see. So uh, welcome, everyone. Hopefully you had a good weekend. I know it's Wednesday, but that's our, that's our first meeting day. Uh, let me see. So this is the top of week three. And so for this week, uh, the intent is to make our way through section 3.1 on exponential functions. So I think we scheduled for, oh, shoot, uh, go back. for exam one to be next week, right? So a week from today. Um, let me let me look at you guys' schedule so I can get you the exact time. I'm not sure if I set yours for 10 a.m. or 2 p.m. Let's see. Here. Here. It looks like I schedule you all's exams to become available basically seven days from now, right? So exam one over sections one, seven, two, five, and three, one will be available next Wednesday starting at 2 p.m. And you'll have it'll you'll have seven days where you can earn hundred percent, like you can earn higher than 90%. After February 9th, um, <clears throat> The exam is due February 9th at, at the start of class on that Wednesday. Uh, but keep in mind with all of these assignments, you can work on any assignment past the due date with unlimited attempts. But when you submit any question after the due date, um, the highest, it's a 10% late penalty. And, and also the hard deadline for all assignments is like May 1st. It's a Sunday night at midnight going into Monday morning. Okay. <clears throat> so what we'll, and like uh, the lecture for this is available. So for section 3.1, it's on my YouTube. I've been doing pretty good about like these sessions, like bring a copy on, onto my YouTube channel. I have one playlist that has, it's basically like I'm just dumping all the all the recordings into that one playlist. You'll see it says spring 2022. Um, hopefully by now, I know there was a group me going at once. Hopefully, you know, you're a part of that. You've already taken advantage of that. Also, hopefully you are already connected with the tutors. I encourage you to just sit down with them or to work together and just get the stuff submitted. Um, it's totally okay. Okay, um, if you have questions or if you have if you have questions or you know anything, just get my attention. I just feel free to unmute yourself because I'm not I have my notifications kind of suppressed so I can focus. Um, so just feel free to unmute yourself to get my attention. Let me check really quickly. I think the chat is okay. Okay. So what we're gonna do um, I have a question actually. <clears throat> we're gonna kind of make our way through as many homework questions Hi, as professor. we can. Okay. Go ahead. Um, yes. So, uh, you know, like how I got unenrolled at the beginning of the of the year. So I I got like I had a I got a hundred on the first week, but it counts as a ninety. But like I couldn't have taken it on the due date. So it's just going to stay a ninety, or can that change? Yeah, the ninety like the assignments has been due so far. That ten percent of that one assignment is like a fraction of a percent of your grade like it's it's not gonna affect you that drastically all right the bulk the bulk of your grade comes from the exams right i think for the entire semester your homework is 10 percent, and it's a lot of, it's it's, it's going to be negligible by the end right each individual uh the quizzes for the entire semester are 10 percent, and then your exams including the final are like 80 percent of the overall grade so the, as long as you get it in there if you got 90 that's more than enough you'll be fine just, you just want to definitely be sure to do well on your exams. Okay. <clears throat> so let's see. So this comes from section three one. So this section is on exponential functions. So again, like again, the, the recording for this lecture is available. So I, what I'll probably do here is again go through as many questions as I can, and then as different concepts and ideas arise, we'll take some time to kind of discuss them. For instance. So we, we're given this function g of x, and we're, find, we're asked to find g of negative 2. So the thing that makes this an exponential function is because our variable is in the exponent, right? So 
our function g here is four to the power of one minus x, right? So that one minus x is in the in the exponent of the four. So then if we if we're going to evaluate this function when x is negative two, we replace x with negative two. We're going to have one minus negative two. So a double negative, one minus a negative, it's double negative, it becomes positive. So then one plus two is three. So then four to the power of three is what? 16 times four is 40, 64, right? 40 plus 24. So let's put 64 here. And you can use calculators. I, I do like to try to practice my mental math. If you ever want to like see something interesting, do a YouTube search for human calculator. And like people just all over the world just have so many different interesting ways to um, crunch numbers. Um, okay, so I want this. Let me go ahead and pull this over here. Let's close that out. And we are working here. We'll fix that momentarily. Let's do, I agree. Come on, choose the file. A graphing calculator rhyme I found. I spent years looking for it. I've never thought to try to make it myself. I'm just not getting into that space of when I'm looking for something, just learn, figure out how to make it myself because that's a, a valuable learning aid. Um, but I eventually did where a school made a, a virtual calculator. So that's what this is. Um, I, it's a ROM. You have to download ROMs and all this other stuff. Um, <clears throat> So it says for this exponential function, f of x equals five to the power of one minus x, evaluate when x is 2.1. Use a calculator if necessary, right? For something like this, to evaluate this exponential, we're just gonna use a calculator. So what I'm gonna do on my calculator, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to insert the function in the upper left-hand corner. I'm gonna click on that y equals. And I'm gonna type five to the power of, notice my use of parentheses, one minus x. All right, so I just type the function in. So now to evaluate this function, I'm gonna I quit, so I hit second mode, so I can quit, go back to the home screen. Now on the right-hand side of the calculator, you see the clear button. Left of that is a button that says V-A-R-S. I think that stands for variables. So I'm gonna click on that button. I'm gonna to go to the right to go to Y variables. I'm gonna click on number one for function and number one again to call on that function Y1 that I just typed in, right? So I went on, put in parentheses. So now I want to evaluate this function when x is 2.1, right? All I'm doing is basically plugging in 2.1 into the function and then using the calculator to spit out the result. The instructions say to type an integer or decimal rounded to three decimal places. So we would do 0.17, you can do zero, um, but I'm not going to type the zero, so I'm just going to do 0 0.17, okay? Now, we're actually evaluate. <clears throat> Let me see, I can go like this. That's fine, hopefully. No, that's not gonna work. This one asks us to find H when X is zero, right? So then if we plug in, if we replace X with zero, we're gonna have one minus zero is one. So then this one is just one over four. Again, if anything is not clear, you just have to stop me, get my attention, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, this one we're asked to find the exponential function of this form that contains the two, the two points shown below. So we wanna find that we wanna model this data, right? So we have these two data points and we wanna fit them to this model, this exponential model. So let me start by, I wanna get a copy of this. Okay. get a copy of the header so I know where it's coming from so if I ever have to recall. So so we want to model this data to this, to this exponential function. So let me start with my model. I have uh, f of x equals c times a to the power of x, right? So now we're just gonna, there's basically two unknowns that we're trying to solve for. We want to solve for c or we want to solve for a. Every time you have an unknown, you need an equation, 
for a piece of information, all right? So since we have two unknowns, two, two main unknowns that we're trying to solve for, that's why we have two main pieces of information to use, right? So what we're gonna do is just, let's go ahead and evaluate when we plug in this, this value. So when X is zero, our corresponding Y is six, right? So let's just plug that in and see what happens. So we said the Y is six. We don't know what C is yet. A, we don't know. And then we said X is zero. So any real number to the power of zero, other than zero, A is what? Uh, that's gonna collapse to one. <clears throat> this guy collapses to one, right? It's C equals six, all right? So we solve for C. Now let's use the second piece of information to go back in conjunction with this to, to solve for A, right? So then when X is three, Y is 48. So now we have 48 equals our C, which is six, A, we still don't know, and X is now three, okay? So if we wanna solve for A, uh, we just wanna use a lot of inverse properties, right? But the inverse of multiplication is division, so we're gonna divide both sides by six, right? Eight, 36, 42, eight, right? Uh, this is fine. Over here we have eight, we have a cubed, right? So then to solve for a, we take the cube root on both sides. Cube root. Fortunately, eight is a perfect cube. And so we get a equals two. So then these pieces of information that we found, these results that we found, our model is going to be f of x equals c, which is six. Our a is two to the power of x. And then we can, we can confirm that the original points work, right? Notice that when X is zero, this goes to one, the answer is six, is what this is. When three, two to the power of three is eight. So this is eight times six is 48. Okay, so let's hop back to Pearson. Is he frozen? Uh, I can't see. Oh, never mind. Equals six times two to the power of x. All right, I'm going to suppress this. So we're x the graph, right? So if we look at this one, we have f of x equals five to the power of x. Um, <clears throat> It's a little bit trippy. I'm, I'm working on an iPad, so I don't know. Um, so we didn't really do any transformations. This is going to just have the basic general shape of an exponential. So of these four graphs that we have on the right-hand side, or of these four graphs, the, the, one, the only one that takes on the basic shape of an exponential. So then part A is the shape of a log. Logs, the log function, the general shape, it kind of come, it starts off kind of vertical coming along the y axis, along that vertical asymptote. <clears throat> and then it kind of goes off to the right, right? So A is the shape of a log function. B is the shape of a linear function, it's just a diagonal line that's not an exponential. C, I think, is a cubic function, which is also not an exponential. The only one that takes on the shape of an exponential here is D, right? So I just did that one based on the generic shape of an exponential. I'm going to go on to the next one. This one we're asked to sketch the graph. We have 1.4 to the power of negative x. Let me think about it. So when the base of the exponential is larger than one, it causes like I think a vertical stretch. It's like the y values get multiplied by a factor of that base. So it just it kind of still kind of maintains the shape. It, gets, it just gets a little bit tall and skinny. But then with that exponent, now we, we've multiplied the inside of our basic function by a negative 
Uh, inside manipulations usually cause a horizontal change, right? This is from transformations from college algebra one. And if we multiply the inside by a negative, it should flip it horizontally over the y-axis. So instead of having exponential growth, we should have exponential decay. Now, let me think about this one. I got this one wrong earlier. Didn't, I didn't confirm my numbers, right? I probably should have just confirmed my numbers. So, so earlier, you know, because it's a number larger than one, I just automatically chose C, but I also was like, well, I should probably confirm some numbers, um, but it ended up being D. And I, again, I would just choose a few values of X and confirm them. Like, yeah, two values of X and confirm, find the corresponding Y, but it should be D, right? It has exponential decay. With the following. So now if we think of the generic exponential function, usually exponential graphs start off flat and then they, they grow up, right? They, they go to positive infinity. That's the basic shape of exponential. But this graph is starting flat and it's going down to negative infinity, right? So only the only real change that it looks like we did, we went from going to positive infinity, we flipped it vertically, right? We flipped it top to bottom. So now it, it goes up to negative infinity. So then the transformation that's gonna cause it to flip top to bottom has to be an outside manipulation. So we multiply by negative outside of our function, right? The only one that multiplied by a negative outside in proper form, and that was the only change, it looks like it's C, right? Because A, A is like the base form of the exponential, so that's just gonna be the regular exponential that we're used to. B, the negative is inside. So that's going to cause it to flip over the y-axis, but we flipped over the x, right? So it can't be b. I see that causes the flip in a proper way. I think d causes multiple flips. I think the rest of them cause too many changes, right? The wrong kind of changes. So I'm just going to go with c here. And again, so that was that was that one is like more about transformations, right? I'm just trying to dust off the cobwebs about transformations. Uh, you you could have also you know. You could have did plug and chug. You could have did like brute force, two several values of x, find the corresponding y, and then see which which equations does it work. That's totally okay. All right? It's it's kind of missing the point, but it's okay. Like sometimes that's what you gotta do. Use use your knowledge of transformations. Again, we're still talking about transformations. Now, if you're not comfortable with transformations, which you know, really the only way you would know transformations, you would have to be exposed to it. If you never had like college algebra one, which I'm not really talking to you guys, um, you wouldn't really know this. Like someone, someone would have to bring this up to your attention. But if you want more practice on transformations, you can actually pull up the hard copy book, and there there is at least there's a section at least a few sections that talk about transformations. I would sit down with either your classmates or the tutor and just kind of go through that section together and like do those assignments just to kind of you know reacclimate yourself to transformations. So we're actually use our knowledge of transformations to compare the graph of the function given below with the parent function two to the x and then graph the given function, right? So we have this y equals two to the x plus three. So we're basically taking the exponential function. We added the three outside of the base function, right? So outside manipulations usually cause a vertical change, right? Because we're adding a positive on the outside, it follows our intuition, so it should go up by three units, right? So it's just a, a basic exponential graph that's been shifted up by three, all right? So now of these graphing options, so I clicked on the I clicked on this little tool to graph. We have six options in this, you know, to choose from. So the first one on the right hand side is a parabola, so that we're not doing a, we're not doing a U shaped graph. The one on the middle left is the cubic function, so that's not one. The middle right is, that's the log function, right? Because remember, log is coming vertically up the y-axis, then it goes up to the right. So, so the middle right is the graph of a log. So then the bottom left is the graph of an exponential. That's the one we want, so I'm gonna click on that one. And it says, click the graph to plot the curve. So I'm just gonna click on the graph, click anywhere, right? So then this menu pops up, and again, we only had one transformation, Notice the base is already set to two, so we don't have to do that. And we just cause a vertical shift up 
by three. So I'm just gonna slide this bar over to three. That's the only transformation, All right? I'm gonna hit the X. Notice the graph has been shifted up by three. That's it. So I'm gonna hit save and check my answer. This is okay. Uh, keep in mind, this is being live streamed to my YouTube and we are like pretty much at the halfway mark. Like you blink your eye. At, like, actually, I, I actually prefer like these shorter sessions because they go pretty quick. And, you know, usually I have time, like if you want to like, if you have questions or whatever, I don't mind lingering um, or hanging out afterwards. But, you know, because you can only take so much of this stuff before it starts to bore a hole in your head. <laughs> like, that's what I remember. I was like, man, I can't take it anymore. But it's okay. So let me see. So another one on transformations. And again, we started with the base function of exponentials, two to the power of X, right? Uh, we have one, two, three transformations that we need to account for. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on the graph. My exponential tool is that bottom left-hand one in this case. So that's the right tool. I'm just gonna click on the graph. It says click the graph to plot the curve. So now when we do multiple transformations um, in succession, I usually like to work my way from the inside to the out. The innermost transformation is a minus two, right? We subtracted two inside our base function. So inside manipulations usually cause a horizontal change. If we subtract two on the inside, that's gonna cause it to move to the right two units, right? So it causes a horizontal shift to the right by two. So that's the first transformation. Now, working away from the inside to the out, the next transformation, we multiply the outside of our base function by three. So outside manipulations usually cause a vertical change. Multiplying the outside by a number larger than one causes a vertical stretch. So we do a vertical stretch by a factor of three. I think that's okay. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Transformation, we added two on the outside of our base function. Again, outside manipulations generally cause a vertical change. So adding two on the outside, it follows our intuition. So it's gonna, we're gonna move it up by two. So we're gonna shift it vertically by two, okay? Upper base, I'm gonna close this out. Let's, let's submit it and see what happens. Uh, okay, let's try it again. Let's go back. Let's see. First, we went right by two. It looks like a, we did a vertical stretch by a factor. Uh, oh, that's six. Okay, that's why. That's supposed to be a three. Okay. And then. And then we went up by two. I think that was a problem is that the vertical stretch we set it to the wrong thing. Okay, let's try that again here. It's like talking and doing, trying to do that at the same time. Okay. Describe how the graph can be obtained from the graph of the, the base function. Oh, let's see. So part A says we shift the base function left two units. That's the wrong way, right? We said we go to the right, so it can't be A. So then B, we take the base function, we go right to stretch vertically and then shift it down to units. No, we went up, right? So it can't be B. If it can't be A and B, the only thing left is C. Take the base function, we go right to stretch vertically and then up to, yeah. I'm gonna go with that. Grab this, okay. So we have two transformations going on. Again, so this is an um, exponential function of natural base e, right? e is like a function in the calculator, similar to pi, how pi is like 3.14, all of that jazz. E, um, e is something similar to pi, it's like this. You know, you get this 2.73, blah, 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 blah. So it's the function in the calculator. Um, so then we have two transformations going on here. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the graph. 
Again, the, the main shape is the exponential, so it's still the same generic shape. And then click here. I just click on the graph. So now the two transformations, the first one, we did a plus one inside our base function, a plus one inside the base function. So inside manipulation usually cause a horizontal change. That's going to move it to the left by one. So we did a horizontal shift. Sorry, so that moves it to the left by one. Then we subtracted five outside the base function. That's going to cause it to shift down by five units. Vertical shift, negative by negative five, right? So inside manipulations generally are the reverse of our intuition, and outside manipulations generally go with, go in accordance with our intuition. Like for instance, we did on the outside we did a minus five, so it went down five. Intuitively, though. Inside, because we added one, you may you may be tempted to say it goes to the right on one, but it's the inside is usually the reverse of your intuition, so it should go left one. So I'm going to hit the X, and I hit C. Since the asymptote, right? So exponentials have exponential graphs or functions, they have a horizontal asymptote. If you don't shift it, then the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero, i.e., the x-axis. But this one we shifted down five units. So the horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals negative five. So the domain of exponentials is all rows. If you go from the very left to the domain is the very left to the very right. So looking at this graph, the far left is negative infinity. You might be tempted to say there's a vertical asymptote, but exponentials do not have a vertical asymptote, right? So what that means is that every x to the right is accounted for. Any x you choose going to the right, you can find the corresponding y. It might be way, way, way up there. You can find the corresponding y. So exponentials have a horizontal asymptote, but not a vertical asymptote, right? So the domain of exponentials um, is all rows, negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, normally the range of an exponential, remember we said the x-axis serves as a, hor as a horizontal asymptote. So normally the range is zero to infinity, where zero has a parenthesis, right? But in this case, because we moved it down by five, now the range goes from negative five to positive infinity. Okay. So then we'll say negative five to positive infinity. Infinity always gets a parentheses. In this case, again, with the horizontal asymptote, it looks like it's actually on the five, but it's actually not. The whole point with asymptotes is that we get really close to them. But if you zoom in, you're actually always going to find space between our graph and the horizontal asymptote in this case. So in other words, we never actually reach the five, so that means the five actually has parentheses. It, it looks like it does, but you, you have to kind of use your imagination and know that the whole point of the asymptote in this context is that you never actually reach that number. You never reach y equals negative five. I want to write an equation where we start with the base function and apply the transformations. So the base function is, is y equals 6 to the power of x. Then it says that that function is translated 7 units to the left, right? So if we're causing a horizontal change, that means that, that 7 needs to be inside the base function. Even though the left is negative x, the inside manipulations are the reverse of our intuition. So we need to say plus 7 on the inside. So it has to be either b or d. It can't be a or, a or c, right? And then it says five units upward. So then that means it has to be D. Out, outside manipulations follow our intuition. Inside manipulations are usually the reverse of our intuition, right? So it should be D. Simple interest, okay. I don't think I even, I, I think we forgot to do this in um, 
but I want to tell this story. I usually like to tell the following story whenever we kind of introduce like compound interest and exponential functions and things. So there's this story of the inventor that this guy, the inventor of the game of chess, right? He invented the game of chess. So the game of chess, let me see. Basically, like on a, a square tile, I think it's eight by eight, right? So I'm trying to get eight eight tiles. I could do it on a graph paper, but I'm just trying to do it as quickly as I can. Four. That's good enough. So then, case. Okay. It don't have to be exact. It's just to kind of tell the story, right? So we have the game of chess, right? So the the chess chess is played on an eight by eight tile, right? And so the event, this inventor, he created this game of chess, he made it, he worked out the keys, and then he presented it to the local ruler, right? So when he showed it to the ruler, he showed the ruler how to play and everything. The ruler was pleased. The ruler was so pleased that he decided to give the inventor his weight in gold as a reward. The inventor thought about the offer and he, he suggested an alternative offer, right? It's the ruler suggested, I mean, the inventor suggested to the ruler, okay, instead of giving me my weight in gold, how about the following, right? Um, let's do, let's see what's going on. Actually, let's do go. So the, the inventor suggested on the first tile, he wanted one, one grain of wheat, right? So let me see, let me take some notes. So on the first tile, he did one grain of wheat. On the second tile, he wanted to do two grains of wheat, right? So we'll do two. On the third tile, he wanted to do what? Four, four grains of wheat, right? And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? He just kept going, right? So on the first tile, we'll let N be the tile, right? On the first tile, he did one grain of wheat. Notice that one is the same as what? Two to the power of zero. This is two to the power of one. And then he did what? Four, which is two squared, so on and so on, right? So this is four. Let's do, this is gonna be what? For n minus one, I'm gonna move these guys. When n was one on the first tile, he did one grain of wheat. On the second tile, he did two grains of wheat. On the third tile, he did four, so on and so on, right? Um, so then the total, let me see. So on the first tile, he had a total of one grain of wheat. On the next tile, if you add the first and the second, he had a total of three grains of wheat, which is what? Two squared minus one, right? So this one, is two to the one minus one. So this is going to be two to the n minus one. This is the, the total. So this is like each tile, each tile, and this is the total. All right. So on the first tile, he had a total of one grain of wheat. Uh, by the end of the second tile, he had a total of three. Let's do the third one really quickly. Notice they should add up to a seven. So the total here is going to be two to the power of three minus one, which is eight minus one, which is seven, right? So this is this is the rundown. So on the on the chessboard, 
a chessboard is an eight by eight grid, right? So we have a total of 64 grids, right? So, so this is, this is kind of where we're stopping here is the same place that the inventor stopped with the, with the root. So again, the, the inventor was like, okay, on the first tile, give me one grade. The second tile, double it, give me two. On the third tile, double that, give me four. And then eight, 16, 32, so on and so on, until we fill the chessboard. So the ruler thought about his suggestion and he agreed to it, right? But I think that the ruler did not really realize how much he really agreed to. Let's look at this, all right? So how much wheat did the ruler agree to pay? How many grains of wheat? So again, if the, the chessboard has a total of 64 tiles, on that 64th tile, the total grains of wheat are gonna be two to the power of 64 minus one, which is gonna be two to the power of 63 grains of wheat, right? And so the total grains of wheat are gonna be two to the power of 64 minus one. This ends up being something like 15 quintillion, some ridiculous amount. Um, this guy. So so if we said two to the power of Got muted. I'm thinking that that just happened. Let me share my screen again. Where the book? Yeah, that, that ends up being 18 quintillion grains of wheat. That's much more wheat that exists in the world today. If the ruler were to actually pay that, he would give over his entire fortune, all right? So when the ruler realized that he couldn't pay the guy and that he was duped, I don't know, like, again, the way the story goes, apparently, do you know what the ruler did? Apparently what he did was off of his head, right? He didn't think he killed the guy. <laughs> that's a morbid, you know, conclusion to the story. But that's just a, so the whole point of this was just a display on, how quickly things can grow exponentially. Like when things are growing exponentially, they can they can get out of hand really fast like that, right? So I think that amount of wheat fits just inside, I think it was like, I don't know if it was a 25 by 25 by a thousand foot square mile, like silo, something like that. Some, some silo, some ridiculously large silo, right? Okay, so I just wanted to kind of share that story. And it was just a display on exponential growth. Um, I think that actually brings us to the end of class. That's close enough for me. Um, so, and I have a recording of our session with the earlier class, and plus that leaves more for us to do on uh, Friday, right? So we'll just save the rest for there, okay? Uh, do you all have any questions about anything before we part ways, okay? So I'll make a copy of these notes available on Blackboard. Anything that you see me doing, you can access it between anything written or any of the recordings, you can access it. On that note, if there aren't any other questions, we're gonna end the session here.
And from one beautiful mind to another, enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, take care, guys. Peace. See ya.